on to lecture. So today we're going to talk about transcription. And the question I'm going to start with to see where you guys are is this one. Every gene that is expressed in a liver cell is present in a neuron. True or false? Okay, click in quickly because this is just true or false. You gotta choose. Okay? This is very similar to what we saw in the last section. There's a preference, but not a clear, clear winner. So let's go through the next slide and then we'll talk about what the right answer is. What does it mean when we say a gene is expressed? It means that it's converted to RNA. And usually, it gets converted to protein. Some genes have, uh, some RNAs actually have a function and don't need to be converted to protein. But in most cases, when we say a gene is expressed, it has to be converted to protein. Because DNA doesn't do anything. It just sits there and codes for the protein. It's like a recipe. It makes the food. It makes the meal. The protein is the thing that does something. So until DNA is converted into a protein, it doesn't really do much. It is silent. Genes are silent until they're expressed. All somatic cells in your body have the same genes, but they do not have the same gene expression patterns. That's what makes them different. Every cell in your body, except for gametes, has the same genes, but which genes are expressed is different in different cell types and under different conditions. So differences in gene expression patterns can account for development, right? You go from a, a zygote all the way up to an adult human with the same set of genes. Turning genes on and off in the right order or to the right level is how you go from a single cell to us, 10 and 100 trillion cells. Tissue differentiation involves changes in gene expression. Responses to stress and development of, of disease Cells are constantly trying to return to homeostasis, their happy place where they want to be. And the tool that they have is to change gene expression. That's how cells adapt to different situations. It is a major part of how they adapt. So actually, let's go back to this one first. So every gene that's expressed in a liver cell is present in a neuron. True or false? I'm not, I'm not going to pull again. True or false? True, true, right? Because every cell in your body has all the genes. It's just which are turned on varies between cell types. What about this one? A gene that is expressed in the liver cell is expressed in the neuron. No, not always. There could be genes, there are genes, that are expressed in the liver and the neuron. Things that every cell needs, right? But not every gene. So this one is false. And this is a good illustration of the fact that you guys need to come into an exam calm, with a clear mind, and read the questions carefully. Because this isn't a question that's trying to trick you. It's a question of trying to see if you understand. But if you don't read it carefully, then you'll miss it when you shouldn't. So read the questions carefully. This slide tells you what the central dogma is, because you'll probably hear that term again. It's often used. What it refers to is that DNA is converted to protein through an RNA intermediate. That is the central law of molecular biology. DNA goes to RNA through the process of transcription, and that's what we're going to do today. RNA, if it's mRNA, goes to protein by being translated, which we'll talk about on Friday. Now, when I was in your shoes in this sort of class, I couldn't get straight which was transcription and which was translation. They sound too much alike, and I couldn't remember which was which. But you know what the words mean already. So transcription is a form of the word transcribe, which means to make a written copy or an exact copy. So if you were going to transcribe the podcast of this lecture, you would listen to the podcast and write down exactly what I said. Be going from the English that I spoke to the English that you write on the paper. So you would stay in the nucleotide language. You're making an exact copy of the DNA as RNA. So it's like transcribing the podcast. 
you're copying DNA nucleotides into RNA nucleotides. When you're translating, you are turning something from one language into another. You're changing the form or condition. So when you translate an mRNA, you're going from the nucleotide language to the amino acid language. So if you were going to translate the podcast, you might translate it to Spanish or Korean or Chinese. You would change the form. So if you translate RNA, you change its form into the protein language. <coughs> this is a figure from your book, and I put a yellow box around what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start by making a few key points. The first one is either strand of the DNA can serve as a template for transcription. People get confused about this, and your textbook says DNA template strand. This is the DNA template strand for this RNA, but somewhere else on the DNA could be the bottom strand. And hopefully by the end of the lecture, that will make sense to you. The next thing is you already know that RNA contains uridine instead of thymine. Thymine. So U base pairs with A instead of T. RNA, lucky for you, is synthesized 5' prime to 3' prime, just like DNA. So that would be really easy to remember. 5' prime to 3' prime for mRNA. And the last is a triplet of nucleotides codes for one amino acid. So it takes three nucleotides to get an amino acid. Yes? Are uracil and uridine synonymous? Oh dear. Are uracil and uridine synonymous? So I think that uracil is the nitrogenous base. Go to Wikipedia. I'll straighten that, right? So I think that uracil is the base, and then uridine has the sugar. I think that, and then the triphosphates make it uridine triphosphate. So I'm pretty sure that's right, but you can check me on Wikipedia. Thank you for asking that, because it is confusing. And I'm going to not make a big deal about it on a short answer or something, because scientists refer to it as uracil uridine. doesn't matter. It's big to me. So in a, in a biochemistry class, they would make a big deal out of it, but I'm not going to. OK, anybody else? All right, so this is an animation from your book. And it's a good overview to start with. The first step in protein synthesis is transcription of RNA from DNA. The portion of the DNA that is transcribed into an RNA molecule is called a transcription unit. An enzyme called RNA polymerase carries out transcription. With the help of protein transcription factors, it attaches to the beginning of a region of the DNA called the promoter, pries the DNA strands apart, and untwists a short portion of the double helix. RNA polymerase moves along the DNA, pairing up RNA nucleotides with their DNA complements, adding nucleotides to the M of the growing RNA molecule. Here's a close-up view of the elongation. Only one DNA strand, the template strand, serves as a template for RNA synthesis. RNA polymerase moves along the DNA strand in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction, adding nucleotides to the 3' prime end of the RNA chain. Note that U in RNA pairs with A in DNA. Once transcription is complete, RNA polymerase releases the completed RNA and detaches from the DNA. Okay, so I want to go back a little bit. Come on. Two, are they zoomed in? Okay, so the template strand of DNA is in blue here, and the RNA, mRNA, is being formed five times to three primes, so the next nucleotide will be added to this three, three prime hydroxyl. You can see that U's are here in place of T. So this is the template strand, and which direction, what, what end of the template strand would this be if I cut the background? Three prime. Right, because the DNA is anti-parallel when it's hydrogen bonded, right? So if this is the three prime end of the mRNA, this has to be the three prime end of the DNA because they're anti-parallel. 
So the template strand is read five prime. The template strand is read three prime to five prime. The new mRNA is synthesized five prime to three prime. The other thing I want you to notice is this strand up here. This is a non-template strand. Sometimes we call that the sense strand because it looks just like the mRNA, but the T's are replaced with U's. So sometimes when you see a gene and it's written uh, in the sense strand, it will look the same as the mRNA, except instead of T's, there are U's in the RNA form. Template strand, sense strand. Which end of the sense strand is this, if I cut the backbone right there? Five prime, right, because it looks exactly like the mRNA. And it's anti-parallel to the template, and this is the three prime end of the template. Questions? Okay, I think I can go to the next one, yeah. All right, so Dr. Abdab mentioned that there are places where transcription starts. I'm going to tell you what those things are now. A big component of where transcription starts is a DNA sequence called the promoter. So this little green line here shows where RNA polymerase first starts copying DNA into RNA. That's the start point for transcription. And the whole piece of DNA that's copied is the transcription unit. The promoter in light green here is the place where RNA polymerase binds to the DNA. So once that RNA polymerase binds to the DNA, it's going to have to pull the two strands apart in order to be able to copy the template strand. Now we know in this case the template strand is on the bottom, right? Because the template needs to run 3 to 5 if the gene is over here, because the mRNA is going to be synthesized 5 to 3 in the direction that the gene runs. So the RNA polymerase 2 will copy the template strand into the mRNA. Now that's how, uh, where transcription begins. It's determined by where the promoter is. And we'll go over the promoter a little bit more in a second. But here's a minimal promoter, sometimes referred to as a Tata box, if you've ever heard of that. It's because it says TA, TA, AA. So that's why they call it that. And it's a part of the promoter. The promoter is much more complicated than that, but this is something that we can manage to talk about. The other thing on this slide that's different from the last one is there's these other balls here. These are protein transcription factors. So they also bind to the promoter. And they help to recruit RNA polymerase 2 and help stabilize its binding. So RNA polymerase 2 won't bind to this promoter very well unless transcription factors are present to help stabilize its association. Protein transcription factors also bind the promoter and regulate RNA polymerase 2 binding. There are binding sites for different specific transcription factors that are variably present. So gene A might have a binding site for the pink transcription factor, but gene B doesn't have a binding site for the pink transcription factor. It has a binding site for the purple transcription factor. Okay? And that's one way that gene expression can be regulated by whether or not these proteins are available and active. Because if they're present, these specific transcription factors bind to the DNA and recruit RNA polymerase II. Now, I made my first animation ever to help illustrate this point. I mean, like, real animation, not just appearing or disappearing. So it's kind of feeble, but I want to make a couple points with it. This is a transcription factor here. It's present in the nucleus. This is RNA polymerase II, also present in the nucleus, but there's no transcription of these genes. This pink thing here is meant to represent the promoter for this gene, and it has a binding site for this transcription factor, but nothing's happening, right? Every cell in your body has every gene, and every gene has a promoter at all times, but those promoters aren't always, uh, the transcription is not always occurring from those promoters, it's regulated. So what, what might regulate transcription? Well, here we have a ligand binding to its receptor at the plasma membrane, this will cause a signal that will activate that transcription factor and make it competent to bind DNA. So now that it's received the signal, the transcription factor binds. Now that its friend is present, 
DNA polymerase II is recruited to that promoter, and its binding is stabilized, and this leads to transcription of that gene. These other genes here don't have the, seed, the binding site for that pink transcription factor, so they are not expressed. They're not transcribed. When this signal arrives, it specifically causes the expression of this gene. And this is one way that it can happen. Gene expression can be regulated. Yes? I couldn't hear you. So what happens to the transcription factor that's underneath RNA polymerase 2? It stays there. It's still bound. Eventually, it will fall off. Anybody else? Okay, so I'm going to try a demonstration here. I want to start out by discussing this promoter business. So the promoter is listed as a single-stranded piece of DNA. We always, when we talk about double-stranded DNA, only give you one strand, because you can always figure out what the other one is. So it's cumbersome to write two strands upside down, so we just give you the sense sequence of the promoter. So the minimal promoter here is TA, TA, AA. And RNA polymerase 2 will bind there, and then it will know the gene is downstream. Downstream is towards the 3' end. So if this is the promoter, the gene is over here running in that direction. Okay? So this promoter has directionality, and it is double-stranded. Now to try to do this demo, I need one volunteer to be RNA polymerase 2. Go for it. Okay. I have a sign for you to put on so everybody remembers who you are. Here's your sign. Okay. Hopefully you guys in the back can see this. If it's here, we're good. Yes? Okay. So, this is a DNA sequence. I have to move it a little bit out so you can walk around it. Okay. Do you see a promoter there? Yes. And if so, RNA polymerase 2 has to this time. I'll ask you guys in a sec if it gets confused. So RNA polymerase 2, is there a promoter there? And where is the gene? Okay, so go walk over there and look at it if you need to. It's confusing when you first look at this. Looking at it both ways, it doesn't look the same from both sides. So where is the gene? Yes, very good. The gene is over here. Now let's see if I can befuddle him. All right, here downstream on that same piece of DNA, we have another promoter. What do you think about that? Where's the gene? Very good. All right, let's see if our RNA is going right to our hand. Very good. Your final challenge, which is the template strand? Well, it's one of these, it's either the yellow one or the white one here, which is a template strand. Yes, he said the three to five. Very good. The three to five. The template is always read three to five. The gene is over here. So the one you read three to five is the white one. Very good. Thank you. You can come get your reward and leave your son. Very nice. So I think I remember to do this. Yes, genes can run in either direction. All right, so RNA polymerase 2 told us that this gene was over here. RNA polymerase 2 told us that gene was over there. Because the promoter has directionality, so he knew where the genes were, and on a single strand of DNA, which is the template strand, can flop back and forth. This is the template strand for this gene. This is the template strand for this gene. So both strands of a chromosome can serve as the template strand. We did that. So what I want you to take away from this, in case you didn't take these particular notes, the promoter is a section of double-stranded DNA. So you see here, there are two strands of DNA. RNA polymerase 2 binds to the whole thing. It stands on double-stranded DNA. This piece of double-stranded DNA will have a particular three-dimensional structure that matches RNA polymerase 2. So it will bind to this piece of double-stranded DNA in a particular orientation and transcribe that way, using this as a template strand. 
So they are double stranded. The next thing is RNA polymerase 2 binds to the promoter. The promoter has a particular structure that matches RNA polymerase 2. Promoters have directionality. So we have two different promoters on the floor. They're exactly the same, but by turning it upside down, we can have the genes in different directions. And if I wrote a promoter like this on an exam, you could tell me which side the gene is on. Promoters determine which strand is the template for RNA polymerization. If it tells you where the gene is, you can figure out which the template is. Genes run in both directions on a single piece of DNA. So even though these aren't connected by letters, they're meant to be on a single chromosome. The template strand can switch back and forth between the two strands of double-stranded DNA. Questions? Promoters are usually pretty confusing to people. So if you have a question, somebody else probably does too. Everybody's writing. Yes? When you say the gene is over there, what do you mean by that? Gene is over there. So if I, I'm going to be RNA polymerase too. If I start transcribing this way and make this the template strand, is it going to make sense? No. So that means there's no, there's no gene here because if I transcribed it, it wouldn't code for protein or anything. But if I bind to it and I say, oh yes, this is the template strand, the gene's over here, and I copy this, it will make something that makes protein. But if RNA polymerase went the other way, it would just get garbage. That's a good question. Yes? That's a good question. So what about AUG, the start code? I'm going to have to go back to, bank to see this. I'm going to do this on the computer, it'll be faster. OK, so this is where transcription starts. But the AUG would be way down here. Okay, So the AUG is the start of translation. But the start of transcription is upstream, 5' prime to that AUG. There's a bunch of untranslated RNA. There. So I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to mention it. The AUG is downstream of the transcriptional start site. When we say downstream, we mean three prime from the same stream. Any more? Those are good. Okay, I think I can do this. Now I'll do it. I have to watch my animation again. Okay, so back to here. A given stretch of double strands of DNA can be a template, oh, I'm sorry, only one strand, the given stretch of double strand DNA can be a template for transcription. So I told you that both strands can be the template, but in an individual region, only one at a time can be a template. So here, the way I have these genes, this is like gene C, and this one is like gene B. So here's gene B going in that direction towards that door, gene C goes in this direction. They don't overlap, OK? So which of the template strands switches back and forth? But if I put gene C down here, then for gene C, one would be the template strand, and then for gene A, the opposite one would be the template strand. That's not going to work. That's very bad. It's maybe hard to understand why, but an analogy might help. So that would be like if gene A and gene C overlapped, It'd be like you buy your Bio 93 textbook. When you read it forward, it's Bio 93, and then you flip it over and read it backwards, and it's your chemistry textbook. <laughs> right? That is never going to work. That is just not going to happen. So we do not have overlapping genes, because they would have to make sense in both directions. And DNA and words do not do that. Questions? OK. So now that we've started transcription, you have to stop transcription. In bacteria, there's a termination sequence that tells RNA polymerase, we're done, get off the gene, stop transcribing. There's a polyadenylation signal in mammals that tells RNA polymerase 2 that it's time to stop transcribing. Now this is the same picture that you saw before, earlier, and your book had designated this top one as the DNA template strand. I've switched it around, and I've designated the bottom one as the template strand. What I want you to do is tell me what is the sequence of the mRNA produced from this template. Write your answer 5 prime to 3 prime. So I switched which is the template strand. 
but you still have to write your mRNA sequence five times to three times. By convention, we write word left to right, mRNA five to three. So go ahead and give that a try. If you don't know what to do, you can ask your neighbor if you want, see if they have an idea. Okay, you guys have 10 more seconds, because at this point, either you get it or you don't.
start site where it actually starts copying DNA into RNA, if it copies all of the G, it will produce something called a primary transcript or a pre-RNA, pre-mRNA. You can call it either one out of pair. This is a copy of the transcription unit. So it's an RNA copy of the DNA template strand. This is not ready to be translated yet because it's got what are called introns in it. Introns are spacers. They don't code for protein. They don't make any sense in the, uh, to the ribosome. So you want them to go away. So what happens is the introns are spliced out. You make a cut at the end of this exon and a cut at the end of that exon, and you put those two ends together. You cannot cut in the middle of an exon. There's specific DNA sequences here that say this is a splice point. And those sequences are in between introns and exons, right? At the junction between introns and exons. So the entity that removes these introns is called the spliceosome. That's the level of complexity we're going to talk about here. It's a complex of proteins and RNA. And this chops out those introns. This is important because introns do not code for protein. They would make gibberish, junk, garbage if you try to translate them. So you need to remove them before you let this RNA anywhere near a ribosome, because it would make junk. The next modification that happens is there is a modified guanine that gets put on the 5' end. That's called the 5' cap. And then on this end, an enzyme adds a long string of adenosine nucleotides. That's why there's dot, dot, dot there, because there's a lot of them, and they would go off the slide. So this is called the poly A tail because a lot of A's were added to the end. Once you've made these modifications, remove the introns, cap and tail, you have a mature mRNA that's ready for export to the cytoplasm. This is going over a couple more things about the cap and the tail. Both of these structures facilitate nuclear export. The ribosomes are in the cytosol. They help protect the mRNA from degradation. And they aid in the association of the mRNA and the ribosome. So these structures help the mRNA find the ribosome. Now I have a quicker question for you. Introns are not found in cytoplasmic mRNA because they're not transcribed by RNA polymerase. They're spliced out by RNA polymerase. Nuclear pores do not let pre-mRNA pass, or they are converted into exons before they leave the nucleus. So we have to go back and review what a protein domain is. 
A domain is an independent folding unit. And in general, each domain of the protein, this is a new part, is encoded by a different axon. So I have stolen a ribbon diagram of a protein from a paper, and it has three domains, the ATP domain, the M1 domain, and the M2 domain. And they're colored based on their exon. So this is the yellow exon, the green exon, the blue exon. Each exon encodes a different domain, and those domains can fold independently. That allows exons to be assembled in different patterns, like Legos. So because they can fold by themselves, they don't have to be next to a particular other exon. This is critical for alternative splicing to work. That one domain is generally one exon, and they can fold independently. Now here's an example of alternative splicing. Alternative splicing is really cool because it lets one gene make multiple proteins that are related but can have very different functions. So here, this is traditional complete splicing. We have a pre-mRNA with three exons. Exons are often drawn as boxes, and then this would be the intron, the thin part in between the two exons. If this is completely spliced, the introns are removed, no exons are removed, you get this. So the ends of the exons are stuck together, and it's an open reading frame that makes the protein shown over here. So exon 1 encodes this alpha helical region here. Exon 2 is some alpha helix plus also this beta sheet over here. And exon 3 encodes this bit of beta sheet there. So that's one form of the protein made from this pre-mRNA. The same pre-mRNA can be alternate, alternatively spliced. In this top example, exon 3 was thrown out with the introns. That's what alternative splicing is, throwing out an intron with the exons. So here, if you eliminate exon 3, you still have domain 1, and you still have domain 2, but domain 3 is missing. So this protein might have a different function. Down here, we also alternatively spliced the pre-mRNA, but we removed exon 2. So we have domain 1 and domain 3, but X domain 2 is gone. So these three proteins are related, but they could have very different functions based on alternative splicing. So alternative splicing allows the same gene to produce several different proteins. Now if that didn't make a ton of sense with those ribbon diagram things, I'm going to try another way with words. So here we have the phrase alternative splicing. In each of those letters, there's about 20 letters, pretend they're exons. And if we're going to alternatively splice, alternatively splicing, we have the opportunity to keep or exclude one of those letters. So the first one I did here, I threw out the A, kept the L, threw out the T, kept the E, threw out the R, threw out the N, and I turned alternative splicing into a different phrase, leave Isaac. It's similar, they're related, but they mean different things. I could also do this, I could say tentative sling. I could do this, I could say native sing. I could do this, at rave spin. Each time, I've left out different letters to make a new phrase. But I can't do this. Here, I moved the letters around. So I took this E, and I moved it in front. That's not allowed. You have this rule. Keep or exclude, but you may not move for the exons. So you just have to leave an exon out or retain it. You can't move exon 10 up to the front of the protein. This is really important because it allows the number of proteins you can make to be larger than the number of genes you have. So I read on the internet, which means it must be true, that a Boeing 767 has 3 million parts. But you only have 20,000 genes. You can make a whole person go from a single cell to your 10 trillion cell self with just 20,000 genes. And one of the reasons why that works is because you can turn each of these genes into multiple proteins. So the proteome is four, at least four to five times bigger than the genome. Now here's an example of why alternative splicing can be really important. It's a story where there's a bee lymphocyte here that's out of control looking for pathogens. And it comes across this guy, a nasty flu virus. And lucky for you, this bee cell has an antibody that recognizes flu virus. 
So that creates a signal when the antibody binds to the flu. This causes the B cell to differentiate into a plasma cell that secretes antibody that recognizes the flu. <clears throat> now what happened between the B lymphocyte and the plasma cell? What changed? The ER grew, the rough ER grew, right? Because what's going to happen? You're going to make a lot of secreted protein. So this is a way that we can synthesize stuff you learned in the first half of the class with the last half of the class of the final. Okay. Alternative splicing permits the anti-flu antibody to be secreted. How does that work? In the B lymphocyte that was resting, just looking for bad guys, it had its antibody in the plasma membrane. So here's a picture of that. It has the exon encoding the transmembrane domain in the mature mRNA. It's retained. <clears throat> so this protein is membrane anchored. Over here, this plasma cell now wants to secrete the very same antibody. It has to be the same antibody so it recognizes flu. But we don't want it to be membrane anchored, so we just leave out this exon. It's alternatively spliced. So now the very same antibody that used to be in the membrane is secreted. Now here's a clicker question for you. Alternative splicing can move exon 1 to between exons 5 and 6. It can splice in the middle of an exon. It works because exons encode protein domains or it can result in the retention of introns in a mature mRNA. Okay, click in quickly because I read you the question. Either get it or no. Okay. Most of you guys got this one right. Right? Very good. It is C. Works because exons encode protein domains. You can't move them around. It's key for exclude. You can't splice in the middle, and this never happens. We're going to go over the last two slides on Friday since we're running late. Okay, so I'll see you Friday. Ask me questions down here if you'd like.